Welcome to this pop-up office hour session. Uh, I wasn't originally planning on having a second session this week, uh, but I've chosen to do so. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. My audio uh, is a little bit offset from where it should be. Hold on just a minute. I forgot to move the mic into its usual, its usual position. Bear with me for just a second there, and now should be magically presto better. Uh, I hadn't planned to do a second session this week, but uh, once again, uh, there was some pretty interesting weather <clears throat> that's uh, now ongoing in Northern California, and we'll move into Southern California by tomorrow. And so I thought folks would be interested uh, in this uh, for a variety of reasons, and I wanted to take a radar and satellite tour, talk about sort of what the system is doing. It is unusual uh, for April in terms of how cold the air mass is, uh, and so just thinking about uh, how this is affecting California, it's always fun to take a look, at, a look at what's going on in real time, and I know folks have really uh, enjoyed that in the past. The highest viewership sessions uh, here on YouTube tend to be the ones uh, where there's real-time discussion of an event. So folks really like those radar tours. Uh, so I, I'm going to give you that uh, momentarily. Uh, I did want to add that uh, the electric, uh, sorry, the um, the internet utility folks, Xfinity, has been in the neighborhood. There was yet another phalanx of utility vehicles around following more outages and connectivity problems. I don't know if the explanation this time is going to be that somehow um, these are like impervious mega squirrels who have returned and wrought havoc on the infrastructure again, um, or whether it's something else. But in any case, they assure me uh, that they are done for the day uh, as of the hour. So we should be in the clear, although if I disappear I don't know whether to blame Xfinity or the squirrels at this point, uh, but the improvements are supposedly ongoing and we should be good for the hour. So uh, before I jump into the, the present system, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit and then work backward. Uh, it does look like this is the last significant system of the sequence. Uh, and once this one rolls out, there may be another weaker secondary system Sunday, Monday, maybe a few more showers, but nothing as notable as what's going on over the next 24 hours. And then after that, conditions do look like they're going to calm down, dry out, and warm up by mid-April. So uh, that is the trajectory. It may even be a little bit warmer than average by mid-April. Nothing extreme. There are no major heat waves on the horizon right now, but it does look like this uh, very cool and very unsettled pattern uh, is not long for this world, although why it has developed right now is an interesting question that I'm going to get into in a bit. So uh, I'm going to start sharing uh, my screen now so you can see some of the real-time imagery that I'm taking a look at right now. Well, now you're just seeing my whole screen. That was not what I wanted to share. Uh, there we go. I don't know why it defaulted to that. Interesting. Um, Oh, I see. Okay, never mind. Now I figured this out. I'm using a slightly different configuration than before. You're going to see your mirror image of me for a moment uh, before it transfers over uh, into the other tab. Um, and there we go. That should be showing what I want it to show now. There we go. So what we've got is a pretty pronounced uh, low pressure system off the coast of, of California. This is not an extremely powerful storm by any means, but it is notable for other reasons in the sense that it has very cold air aloft, meaning air well above the surface for the time of year. It is now officially April. The sun angle is officially higher in the sky, meaning that the ability of the sun to heat this, the lower levels of the atmosphere, the boundary layer, is much stronger than it would be in winter because it has to if effectively move through a less thick layer of the atmosphere to make it to the surface so that sun's energy 
uh, thought that the sun's energy is changing so much over time, but the uh, amount of the atmosphere that it has to pass through to get to you has decreased uh, as that angle becomes uh, less pronounced. So instead of it being low on the horizon on a cold winter day, it's it's we're getting uh, we're, we're now within uh, a couple months of the summer solstice. So uh, this is the time of year where there is more daylight, where the sun is at least in the middle of the day is able to heat the surface more effectively than it is in midwinter. And that's important because this is why we're not seeing record-breaking low temperatures at the surface. Uh, if this was a, an, a, an atmosphere we saw, uh, say, in January, we might be looking more at, at even lower snow levels than we're already seeing and more widespread freezing conditions that would present even greater agricultural concerns. Not a huge risk of that with this event. It could happen locally. But what's the reason why this, this very cold temperatures in the upper layers of the atmosphere are important are essentially uh, that the, the lapse rate, the rate at which temperatures decrease with height, is very steep, so very high. So, so temperatures at the surface that are not extremely cold, they're cool, but they're not that cold. But temperatures uh, several thousand feet and maybe 10 to 15,000 feet in the atmosphere are very, very cold. Uh, well below freezing. And because of that, the that lapse rate, which is part of what dictates the stability of the atmosphere, uh, how how uh, how unstable it is and how what the propensity is for it to develop convec deep convective showers and thunderstorms, that very steep lapse rate that we have today across much of California, and even steeper tomorrow potentially, is very favorable for the development of convective activity, showers and thunderstorms and also favorable for uh, elevations that are, that are actually not themselves at or below freezing to see certain types of frozen precipitation because the overlying atmosphere above the above freezing layer is so deep and so cold that some of the frozen precipitation that forms way up there in the atmosphere where it's super cold simply doesn't have time to completely melt by the time it makes it to the ground. So today what we're seeing across Northern California is a mix of different precipitation types, including multiple frozen precipitation types. Of course, in the mountains and in the higher hills, there is legitimate snowfall, actual dendritic snowflakes falling. Uh, and I've seen reports of that widespread uh, at this point down to 2,2500 feet, which is pretty low in the foothills and in coastal California, but locally as low as about 1,500 feet or even a little bit lower. I wouldn't expect that to be widespread or for there to be major accumulations at 1,500 feet or lower, but it does seem like it's happening at least a few spots. So meaningful accumulations could happen in the two to 3,000 foot range, and that means that some of the Bay Area peaks, including even uh, the Skyline Boulevard, uh, or Highway 17 corridor in the Santa Cruz Mountains, could see accumulating snowfall today. Uh, uh, this is the kind of day that I, I would go up there uh, when, when I was at Stanford, uh, either uh, on bike or in a uh, zip car at the time. Uh, probably the only time those uh, Stanford-based zip cars ever saw snow was when people uh, like me would drive them up into the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, on a day like today, when there is snow along probably down to about 2,000 feet locally. It's a little bit patchy, but generally speaking, on a day like today, you can find places where it is snowing, and, and early this evening might actually be your best bet for that. As the coldest air aloft moves in just before sunset, there's still enough instability for those heavier showers to move on shore, uh, but that sun angle starts to go down in the sky, so uh, those temperatures stay cold closer to the surface. So there's been some snow in the Santa Cruz Mountains, Mount Tam, Mount Diablo, Mount Hamilton, and then to lower elevations up in the North Bay, Mount Cobb, parts of um, southern Mendocino and Lake Counties, even below 2,000 feet, and in the Sierra foothills as well. So some late season low elevation snowfall. A lot of this is convective snowfall, so it's falling even well below the actual atmospheric freezing line. So the freezing line might be up at 3,000 feet, but we're getting snow down to 2,000 or even 1,500 feet because those heavy downdrafts are dragging that frozen precipitation to even lower elevations. And so with this satellite imagery, you can kind of see this, this feature. There isn't really a very well-defined uh, cold frontal rain band. Take a look at the, the feature over, over Southern California. There's some clouds, but they're just discontinuous weak cumulus and stratocumulus. There's nothing really going on there. Uh, sorry, there's, this is the correct cursor. Uh, but the, 
the the more interesting thing that's going on is all up in central and northern California now with this spiraling zone of popcorn showers and scattered thunderstorms, these cumiform clouds, uh, which are essentially these convective showers and thunderstorms that are dropping the snow to lower elevations. When I mentioned other precipitation types, some people are seeing small hail, which can fall even all the way down to sea level when the temperature is well above freezing because, again, as I've talked about before, those are like uh, BBs of ice. Uh, they're, they're quite uh, robust to, to melting, so they can fall pretty fast. They're smooth. They're aerodynamic. They fall quickly through the cloud and often don't have time to melt by the time to make it to the surface. These are what you'd see in the heavier showers and even in the thunderstorms when there could be local accumulations of small hail uh, in some places uh, in Northern California or even Southern California today into tomorrow as these isolated or scattered thunderstorms move on shore. And if you're driving on the freeway and you encounter a small hailstorm like that, uh, you may not care very much whether it's technically hail versus snow versus graupel or sleet or any other precipitation type because it is frozen and if enough of it falls it can accumulate on the road surface and, and wreak havoc. So um, we're not going to see snow at sea level by any means out of this event, but we could well see some accumulating small hail as occurs uh, almost every year somewhere in California during March or April all the way down to sea level. So this is rare in any given location in any given year, but overall happens every single year essentially uh, somewhere in California uh, and often late in the season. Some folks are asking why uh, is the uh, uh, why is we seeing some of the lowest snow levels of the whole season in April? And there's you know part of that is is random chance. Part of it is a particularly unusual atmospheric wind pattern over the North Pacific that I'm going to show you in a moment. But the other reality is that the atmosphere is not fully in sync with the astronomical seasons. So we talk about the meteorological winter lagging astronomical winter essentially because we live effectively on a water planet. You know, 70% of the Earth is water that has a high heat capacity. It has a high thermal inertia, you could say. And so when the northern hemisphere cools in winter, it takes a little longer to cool because those oceans are still giving off some heat that it would retain from the, the northern hemisphere summer months. So in the first half of uh, astronomical winter, it often isn't as cold as it is uh, in the second half of astronomical winter and even into early astronomical spring. Astronomical meaning spring because of, from the perspective of the rotation of the, uh, of the Earth around the sun, but meteorological spring can lag a little bit. So it's not that surprising that we can get really cold air aloft into April even if we really don't get that same kind of cold air in the atmosphere over California at an equivalently early time in spring. And it's partly because of that lag. Even in a typical year, we would expect that often early spring uh, would be significantly colder even than late autumn. Uh, so, And that's because of this lagged uh, seasonality effect. This year also, we have that, that notion that the atmospheric circulation patterns would be a little bit winter-like a little bit later into spring, because of this very strong El Nino event that is decidedly now fading. So that is rapidly going away, but in its last gasp may have influenced the circulation over the North Pacific the last few weeks. I think it's less likely to do so moving forward. But again, we do occasionally see very cold air masses uh, and very unstable air masses bringing thunderstorms and no elevation snow showers. Uh, in California this time of year. It is not that rare to see a, a, some snow showers in late March or early April in places like the Santa Cruz Mountains or the Diablo Ranges or the, or the, the Sierra Foothills. Um, I will say though, and this is something, the next thing I would like to show, uh, and let me, let me just make sure, uh, oh, now I'm remembering why I put this in a different tab. Uh, it was because it was it was resulted in an infinite mirror. Let me quickly fix this. Um, okay, uh, there we go. Um, so I just needed to fix something on my end, but now I think now all is as it should be on your end. Um, so you can see, obviously, uh, this this broad scale feature. And actually, while I'm on here, what I really want to do is zoom in first. 
Um, here's a view of, of the Bay, uh, essentially of, of Central and Northern California. You can see that there is a little bit of a, a frontal band over the Sierra foothills and mountains, but behind it, there's clearing. So over the San Joaquin Valley, uh, in the Carquina Strait, uh, most of the Bay Area, the skies are in many places partly cloudy or clear with some isolated downpours. But look at what's offshore. These are all showers and thunderstorms. These are all going to continue to spin. And this region is clearing here is why there's so much instability. As I mentioned, that, that, that strong April sun is peeking through the clouds here, but that air aloft is still really cold. So it's actually the case that right now, where are places that are sunny right now across the Bay Area and the, the western San Joaquin and the clearing in the central Sacramento Valley right now are more likely to see heavier duty thunderstorms later because that clearing is allowing that instability to build in that region here. But there's something else I wanted to show, uh, and this is a, a little bit esoteric, but bear with me, uh, and I think you'll, you'll find it interesting. This is a map showing the current 500 millibar geopotential height pattern over North America. And the pattern itself is depicted by just the, the, the black contour lines. So you can kind of follow them. Uh, there is a big ridge over the Gulf of Alaska, a deep trough now over California with a low pressure in the base another uh, strong ridge over uh, the Canadian, uh, our northeastern Canadian Arctic, really, uh, and then another strong low pressure system right now uh, centered over, over West Virginia and affecting the eastern seaboard. So a pretty dynamic pattern, but what does this all mean? Well, right now, there's, this is a very highly amplified pattern, and you can kind of ignore this whole column on the left. It's pretty confusing. But I want you to focus on several different features on this map. The first is here, uh, this big red blob in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, places where there are red colors suggests uh, that this is one of, if not the strongest, 500 millibar ridge on record uh, for late March through mid through a three-week window from late late March through mid-April in this region on record. So this is a potentially record strength uh, middle atmospheric high pressure system to the west of California right now. That's notable. There's also same same deal over uh, northeastern Canada and then again uh, over the eastern Caribbean. So on this map, there are right now presently three, uh, three ap regions of uh, at middle atmospheric high pressure that are higher that either as high or higher than, than than previously recorded values this time of year in three separate regions on this map simultaneously, which is saying something. But the one that matters the most for California conditions is this one, uh, because it's immediately upstream and the wind, uh, when you see contours like this in the northern hemisphere, the wind is going like this. Uh, the wind, the winds, the geostrophic winds are parallel uh, to these, con these geopotential contours. And so the overall flow in the atmosphere is generally from west to east, but it's west to east in a way that flows parallel uh, to uh, these black lines. And in this case, uh, the reason why that's interesting is you can see on average the flow you know, gets you from west to east if you trace it through, but locally there are large deviations from that, including uh, over and just west of California, where we have this almost due north to south flow. Well, that's where all the cold air is coming from. Right now, this big blue blob over California is being sourced way up in here, uh, over Canada and the Yukon. And so all this cold Canadian Arctic and Yukon Arctic air is just diving southward toward California. But of course, as we've talked about before, this is a modified Arctic air mass, meaning that it's not coming to California through some circuitous overland path and staying really cold at the surface. Instead, it's moving over the open ocean. The open ocean, which I might add, is much warmer than it used to be. And so the surface levels of the atmosphere are substantially being modified or warmed by that warm ocean, that modifying influence of the Pacific. This is why it's not snowing at sea level in California, even though the air aloft is extremely cold for this time of year. So what we do see, though, is that the overall thickness of the atmospheric column, uh, it's not quite the absolute coldest uh, that we've ever seen this time of year over California. So in fact, it has been colder. Uh, but it is decidedly at the very low end of the distribution. So we have record-breaking high pressure here and here and here, and we have two low pressure systems that are not record-breaking, but are in are close to it uh, in both California and over West Virginia right now. So this is that low pressure over California, which is really, this is a fancy way of saying 
this upstream record breaking ridge is part of the reason why we have a near record breaking uh, middle atmospheric low pressure system right now and very cold air aloft over California because the presence of this ridge here forces this downstream uh, deep trough with almost due north to south a flow west of California bringing that cold air. So everything is connected uh, is, is one way of thinking about it. Uh, but if we look, uh, I'm going to go back here in this tool, it takes a second. Uh, but if we look at the actual temperatures uh, at 500 millibars, so that was the, the thickness of the atmospheric layers, which is proportional to the temperature throughout the whole layer. But if I look at specific layers, and it's taking a minute here to load because this is a, a NOAA tool. In fact, I am afraid that by even showing this to folks, uh, they usually only allow 10 or 15 people into this tool at once. So it is possible that even by doing this live stream, I've caused a problem. So perhaps I may need to ask folks to not, not crowd the, the URL. This is the problem with uh, publicly supported products sometimes is they are not necessarily designed for wide consumptive use. Um, so it looks like I'm not going to be able to bring that up. I wonder if I've accidentally caused that problem. Sorry, Noah. I wish there was more public support for the computing infrastructure on the on the on the Noah side. But anyway, um, I'm going to move on from this uh, and talk about some. I'm going to take a look and quickly see uh, what comments are coming in at the moment. Um, okay, they're not coming in fast and furious, but the connection looks good, so we're going to continue to go. Uh, now, what I'm showing is, um, this is a map, this is the pivotalweather.com, not a government site, although, as I would note, all of the underlying data and models do come from uh, government-funded, uh, your tax dollars at work, etc., uh, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but this site is a nice way, uh, it's a slightly more accessible way of accessing that information that is... Uh, that you've already paid for with your taxes. Um, this is just showing the amount of CAPE or convective available uh, potential energy, really a metric of, of the updraft, updraft strength of, of showers and thunderstorm clouds. Um, this is starting right around, this isn't a few, okay, let's just start nowish. So this is nowish, you can see these gray valleys moving in across the Bay Area and, this, and the Sacramento Valley. This is indicative of that thunderstorm potential this evening in the Bay Area. Uh, continuing near the coast overnight, probably not inland since there's not enough instability. But right along the immediate coast, you can see that instability uh, locally pretty high, uh, as much as a thousand joules per kilogram offshore, which is pretty hefty for California standards. But as we get into tomorrow afternoon, that instability again, as that sun increases, it increases again over the Bay Area, but particularly along the central coast and into Southern California. So these are some pretty high values. Uh, 500 to 1,000 joules per kilogram from about Monterey County southward uh, all the way down towards San Diego uh, by tomorrow evening, um, locally in the southern San Joaquin Valley as well, and also, again, popping up pretty high in parts of the Bay Area again tomorrow. So really, coast, uh, there's actually a higher potential for thunderstorms along the Bay Area, Central Coast, and, and L.A. County, Southern California, than there is the Central Valley with this event, which is a bit unusual partly because the low is spinning right down the coast. Um, this is tomorrow, late afternoon, early evening. This could be a pretty active day. Once again, LA County, Ventura County, Orange County, San Diego County, these are pretty hefty uh, Cape values uh, by the standards of California. Although again, Bay Area too. So really, um, tomorrow may be an even more active day in terms of thunderstorms, essentially, is the short version, than today is. Um, and then things fade away after that. Uh, one thing I will say is I'll bring up this very complicated looking plot here. Uh, and uh, that's not what I meant to bring up. Let me, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the hodographs. We've talked about those before. Just going to show that these don't look super favorable for like a, like a mini supercell outbreak. So what we're more likely to see is pulse type thunderstorms, which could be quite strong, bring torrential downpours, uh, accumulating small hail and, and dangerous lightning anywhere, but not super organized. So not a super high likelihood of severe storms, although, you know, when there's Cape in California at this time of year, given the track record this winter, could there be an isolated severe thunderstorm with a flash flood or a local funnel cloud or tornado? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against it, but I also don't think it'll be particularly widespread. The bigger deal will be the heavy downpours and potentially the 
accumulations of small diameter but potentially uh, prolific hail, so potentially accumulating hail down to sea level. This could be a major problem in the Bay Area and LA commutes tomorrow, especially the afternoon evening one. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show here, uh, going to winter weather, just looking uh, at what the, the total snowfall could potentially be, um, just highlighting the fact that this is not a super heavy snowfall event uh, for the mountains necessarily compared to some big winter storms, but we will see accumulating snowfall down on, uh, this is some of the peaks, uh, these, and these may be undersold a bit, um, the values down to about two, the, two, or, two or three thousand feet could be a bit higher, uh, but the mountains above the Big Sur coast could actually see quite, you know, a, a six plus inch accumulation of snowfall. Uh, the, the lower foothills, uh, parts of Mendocino and Lake counties, as has been noted earlier, um, and then also fairly low snow levels in the mountains of Southern California. So uh, if you're going up to the mountains tomorrow or Saturday, there, there will likely be some snow, uh, even potentially locally on the grapevine, which is a little bit late for that, although certainly not unheard of. Um, so wouldn't be too surprised to see that unfold. So I'm going to close this. Uh, I'm going to close. All right, well, I'm going to go back to that situational awareness table. Uh, maybe enough people logged off that uh, we were able to um, break through here. But again, just showing that for the most part that there are places in the subtropics right now with temperatures that are truly record-breaking in the middle atmosphere right now across broad regions, there may be a little speck of temperature that's uh, Near, at or near the all-time record for, for middle atmospheric low temperatures at this point in April off the California coast. But note, look how tiny that little uh, light purple is compared to the volume of red. As usual in a warming world, the ratio of record warmth to record cold is almost overwhelming. And you can see that even in this chart on the, on the left. There's a few places where there are some min values rec uh, denoting where there are locally uh, record minimum cold temperature values, but look look how many uh, record maxes outweigh those record mins. That's pretty much par for the course. We see that all the time now. And then look later. Maybe not max, but everything's up in the 99th, 99.5th percentile. So uh, that's what happens in a warming world. So going back to the satellite, uh, I wanted to, to take a look here. And then uh, I'll leave this up while I take a look at some of the questions that have come in, and then I would like to take a look at the radar. So I'll do a radar tour in a moment, but first I'll leave the satellite up, take a look at some questions. So uh, one question that I've partially answered, the first question was about whether the unusually warm ocean temperatures and the subsequent modification of the system are the main reason that we are not expecting a widespread frost event in the Bay Area. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the unusually warm ocean temperatures, although they are adding to this. It's mostly just the fact that this air mass is coming in over the ocean period. That is just not the right kind of trajectory for a low pressure system to bring a widespread a frost or freeze event, even in the middle of winter. Overwater trajectories usually modify that Arctic air at the surface to such an extent that it just isn't super cold. The exception can be if it really dries out and clears out rapidly afterward, but this isn't really the right time of year for, for that really rapid uh, nighttime clearing with strong radiational cooling that might produce it. So really the main answer is the system has an overwater trajectory. The lower levels of the atmosphere are being strongly modified by the, by the presence of the ocean. Most of that modification is just because the ocean is always well above freezing across the entire trajectory between Alaska and California. But that is probably being amplified a little bit by the fact that the ocean is even warmer than it normally would be. So that may be adding even a little bit additional uh, warmth to the lowest levels of the atmosphere. But keep in mind, this does not modify the middle levels of the atmosphere. So uh, this this air, again, if you go up, uh, you know, 10,000 feet in the atmosphere, the air is bitterly, bitterly cold right now. Near record cold, but it is not near record cold at the surface. So what that means is that the rate at which temperatures decrease with height, those lap, lapse rates, I wouldn't be surprised if the Oakland sounding 
had one of the steepest slaps rates on record for early April in the Bay Area. I'm not even sure if that's the kind of record that's formally kept. That might be a statistic for the folks at the Weather Service in uh, Monterey to pull up. I don't know what kind of data there are on time series of surface to 500 millibar lapse rates, but this would probably be one of the stronger ones in that period of record in this part of the world, which is again part of the reason why we're seeing uh, the appearance of the system on satellite as we are and why we're expecting significant thunderstorm activity along with uh, hail down to sea level locally and snow locally down to 2,000 feet or even a bit lower in a few spots. Um, there's a question about the monsoon. We don't really have good monsoon predictability. Um, California is even harder because it's on the fringe of the monsoon, so it's not even in the core summer monsoon zone. So I'm even less inclined to make a prediction for the monsoon than I used to be. And in any case, it's far too early to say anything at this point. So uh, I don't have any comment at the moment. Comment from Chris that the snow falling on top of Mount Diablo, not remotely surprising. I think there's actually snow falling at least a thousand feet below the summit in different parts of the Bay Area, maybe more. Mary mentions that it snowed in the Santa Cruz Mountains last night. I wouldn't be surprised if it does again this evening. Uh, a question about why the polar vortex is spinning backwards. I'm guessing this comes from a very misleading newspaper headline from earlier this week. It's essentially in incorrect. Uh, the, the polar vortex is not spinning backwards in any meaningful sense of the word. Uh, without going into detail, which it is pretty complicated, but what the polar vortex actually is, it just keep in mind that it does occasionally, uh, it does occasionally ha have, it's, it's essentially not a vortex. Uh, it, it actually becomes, or it's not a cyclonic vortex anyway. Sometimes it does actually reverse direction and become an anti-cyclonic vortex. Uh, I, I, it's not actually happening right now, but there was a strong uh, reduction in the, the, the cyclonic winds uh, in this upper atmospheric feature in the polar regions, which again, it usually happens at least a couple times a year, and certainly every couple of years. So um, it's been framed as this earth-shattering event when actually it's something that happens quite frequently and on average uh, at least once a year. So it's just something that happens sometimes, and it's not even actually true to say that it's fully spinning backwards. Steven mentions a big hail blast here in the North Bay. Not surprising. Um, there'll be more of those to come elsewhere. Uh, John Ricks the comments slash asks anomalous ocean basin temperatures seem to have an unknown influence besides GHG. I'm assuming greenhouse gases and El Nino. What's your thinking on the reasons for this? Again, I've talked about this in recent sessions. This is related to this notion that we have no idea why 2023 was so hot, which I think has now been thoroughly uh, disproven uh, and clearly demonstrated by some pretty basic plots, actually, that 2023 globally was right in the middle of where climate model predictions thought we would have been at that point. Much has been made of the fact, in fact, there's some new research this week suggesting, uh, or I should really say reiterating, uh, that the rate of warming, planetary warming, appears to have increased in recent years, and that this appears to be due to the, the rather rapid reduction in aerosols. This is different, though, than being related to the specific reduction in marine aerosols from changes in shipping regulations in 2020. That is part of it, but it is a small part of it overall. What, what, the big picture is that the warming probably is, is starting to accelerate a little bit globally, as had been predicted for decades by climate scientists and climate models, precisely because this is exactly when we thought that aerosol, aerosol pollution would start to significantly and fairly rapidly decrease, which would essentially unmask some of the latent warming that had effectively, the warming effect is already there, but it was being artificially reduced by this other kind of competing aerosol pollution in the, in the global atmosphere. And really what's happening is now that that aerosol pollution is decreasing, some of that latent warming that had already 
occur that imbalance in 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 the atmospherics and the atmospheric uh, energy budget is now becoming more obvious because we don't have those aerosols uh, sort of shielding us from that to the same extent that we did. Uh, and I've talked about this with you know much greater detail in previous uh, in previous sessions, so I won't go into too much detail, except to say that there is a lot of confusion regarding what these studies that came out this week are actually saying. The study is saying that because of this decrease in aerosols over the past decade or so, that the warming has accelerated is not new information necessarily. It's actually confirmation of a prediction that had long been made and that was already incorporated within predictions that the warming probably would start to accelerate right around now, which it appears to be doing. So as I've said so many times before, none of this is good news. It isn't really intended to be reassuring because I don't think that it is except to say that I think that overall we still have a pretty good understanding of what's going on, why the atmosphere is as warm as it is, why the oceans are as warm as they are. Now, there's some indication that it may be the case that the effect of decreasing aerosols is maybe a bit bigger uh, than some of the median estimates, within range, by the way, of a lot of formal estimates from the past, but perhaps at the upper end of those estimates. And if that ends up being true, it, has, it means two things. One is it means uh, that future further reductions in aerosol uh, content in the atmosphere, which are likely to occur, may result in a larger increment of unmasked warming than we thought, which means that the near-term trajectory for global warming could in fact be slightly faster than the median projections uh, might have otherwise uh, suggested. But even then, uh, it's still something that's within the range of what we've been talking about for a long time, and we don't fully know yet if that's the case. It's not an overwhelming influence. It does not mean that we're going to experience runaway warming or anything like that. But it does mean that we're, we're less and less likely to be tracking the low end of expectations of how much warming will result from a given amount of greenhouse gas emissions in the real world. Not so much because the greenhouse gases are accumulating much faster than expected or because the warming from them is necessarily more than expected, but it's more likely to be because we've potentially slightly underestimated the cooling effect that aerosols had historically and therefore the net warming effect they might have moving forward as they decrease. So that's about all I'll say about that for now, although I'm, I'm guessing that won't be the last time we have a conversation like this in these sessions. It's a quite a popular topic. All right, back to the, the subject at hand, the short-term weather here. Um, Sarah mentions that it's just started snowing at about 2,700 feet in western Nevada County foothills. Not surprising. It probably could snow down to locally 1,000 feet even below that. Um, David mentions 2,400 feet east of Sacramento in the foothills, about an inch of accumulation so far. So again, widespread snow down to about 2,000 feet and locally lower. Joyce mentions snow at 1,250 feet in the hills in eastern Napa County. Uh, not sticking, not hail. I, I, I believe you. Um, I, I can believe that that locally happened. We've seen some bursts of convective precipitation to much lower levels because, again, that middle atmosphere is extremely cold. As I mentioned, near record cold at mid-levels of the atmosphere, but not at the surface. By the way, there may be a few places that see uh, something that's a relatively esoteric record today of the record low maximum temperature, meaning that the, the lowest daily high temperature on record for the calendar date, it's a bit of a tortured metric, uh, but what it means is it never got very warm. Not that it was extremely cold at night, it just means that it stayed really cool during the daytime, mostly in places where uh, it was raining or snowing all day and where there was very little sunshine. Uh, Loretta mentions on Alpine Road now, and this may have been a little while ago, uh, but uh, that it's snowing uh, at uh, about 1,350 feet in the Santa Cruz Mountains. That's pretty low. Uh, so again, folks, uh, if folks head up to the Santa Cruz Mountains, there's a high likelihood you'll either see snow on the ground or snow falling the rest of today, today, into this evening. But again, be careful because uh, a lot of folks aren't used to driving in it and don't have uh, tires that are meant for snow. Caltrans, as I mentioned, I, did, was, I, I, I was somewhat amused to learn that Caltrans does staff snow plows in the Santa Cruz Mountains. You will see them uh, plowing Highway 1 
uh, if you go up there. Um, something that I think a lot of folks who live in the Bay Area are always surprised to learn. They don't have a lot of plows though. It might actually just be one or two converted dump trucks that have a, a plow attachment on the front. I'm not quite sure if there's any Caltrans employees uh, in the call. But anyway, it's a bit of an interesting sight. I have a photo of a snow frosted sign uh, saying something. I think it's uh, it's pointing to Palo Alto in one direction and San Francisco in the other, uh, which is always a little bit of a novelty because then people say, where the heck did this happen? And you say, well, it's cheating a bit. This was up at almost 3,000 feet in the mountains above the Bay Area. Anyway, uh, it is it is always pretty fun when that happens up there. Oh, uh, Joyce asks, what's going on with the regular striped cloud formation shown in Central California at lower levels? Uh, since I have the satellite up still, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll take a look. Uh, oh, okay, so I think it's probably, they've sort of gone away in the last few frames, but I'm guessing these, sort of this region is what people were talking about in the earlier frames. These are essentially wave clouds, so these form uh, when there is a somewhat stable atmosphere and there's cross barrier flow. So down here, uh, there are the coast ranges and the coast mountains. Uh, so here are sort of the Big Sur coast, the mountains inland of the Big Sur coast, and these are sort of the coast ranges down here. These are forming on the lee side or the downwind side of the coast ranges. Essentially, this is what happens when the wind is forced up over the mountains, it falls back down, and then because uh, there is a stable layer in the atmosphere. It kind of just bounces around up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Uh, in the up locations, it forms a shallow cloud because cooling and condensation with upward motion as the pressure decreases. In the downward regions, it forms essentially a mini trough where there's downward motion, subsidence and warming, and you go out of the cloud layer. So there's a classic, there's like six or seven bands here in these earlier frames. But as you can see, these are kind of falling apart in the last couple frames and that's indicative of this atmosphere becoming less stable and destabilizing as surface heating uh, increases and as the likelihood of showers and thunderstorms goes up. So this is actually a stable, non-precipitating environment initially, but it's now becoming progressively more unstable. That's a good catch. That's pretty cool out there. Comment that there's double rainbows over Walnut Creek. It's definitely a good cloud watching day and, and then again tomorrow across central and southern California in many places. Question from Elizabeth Rubin about whether we know how climate change will affect May Gray and June Gloom in Southern California. That's actually a really complicated question. Maybe it's a topic that I'll have a dedicated session for sometime in May or June, maybe when it's appropriate. But the, the sort of the one cer sentence answer is we actually don't really know. And the question about fog might be different than the question about a more elevated sort of marine stratocumulus layer. So depending on how we define May Gray, is it a cloud of any kind? Is it specifically fog or is it that coastal stratus? Um, the answer might be different and it's probably different also for different segments of the California coast. Um, so that actually would be a good topic for a more in-depth discussion in a future session. So let's plan on that later this spring. Remind me if I forget. Okay, so let's do a radar tour uh, since I, I promised that earlier. Got to switch over to screen sharing a different app. You'll see radar scope on the screen. Uh, that should be full screen momentarily. Just give me a moment and you'll see it pop up. Um, not quite full screen. You're seeing a partial mirror image, let me just, okay, now that should be as intended as I increase the size on the screen. Just waiting for the program to respond. All right, so what you're seeing is uh, an animation, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, over the Bay Area. Right now, most of the central Bay Area is clear to partly cloudy, no active weather, it cleared out. This does not mean the storm is over. In fact, the bulk of the storm may be yet to come. Uh, and there's some hints of that. There was actually just a lightning strike 
east of Morgan Hill, so there's a thunderstorm down here, and there's a line of showers developing sort of up into the North Bay. Perhaps this is that zone of hail that we heard about earlier and into the southern Sacramento Valley. But you can see there's these spokes of, of, of additional showers uh, coming in from over the ocean, and I would expect these to intensify considerably into showers and thunderstorms as they swing uh, sort of onshore like this the rest of the day. Uh, Big Sur Coast, by the way, I'm getting hammered by some heavy showers right now. Um, this could be a problem given the Highway 1 closure. Uh, in fact, there have been evacuations from Big Sur, not because Big Sur itself is necessarily at risk, but because uh, you may not be able to travel on Highway 1 uh, getting into Big Sur. So trying to get the tourists out, get as many people who aren't prepared to hunker down there for a potentially extended period of time. This isn't a huge storm rainfall-wise, maybe up to an inch or so on average, but the problem is these heavy showers and thunderstorms could drop a half an inch in just 10 or 15 minutes, and that could easily be enough rain to cause a new landslide or mudslide that takes out another section of uh, Highway 1, particularly in the section that's already severely eroded from the last storm. So that's the reason there. This is certainly not the most extreme storm of the winter for Big Sur, and yet it could have major impacts because of the cumulative impacts of everything that came before and the relatively high rainfall rates that we might see with these thunderstorm downpours over the next 24 hours or so. So if we go over to Sacramento radar, uh, now, yeah, this is sort of what I was talking about. We see this rapid development of thunderstorms just north of Sacramento now, about to move toward uh, Roseville. So you can see that there's some lightning strikes now in this area up between Woodland and Carmichael. Uh, more, more, more to come, and the more sun there is in this region, the more storms we'll get later uh, inland. So again, um, these aren't severe storms, but they're probably producing hail. So if you're on, I guess this is already past I-5, but uh, if you're on 80, you could see some hail transitioning to snow somewhere around uh, Auburn to, to Forest Hill uh, type uh, elevation. And in fact, what, let's see what happens if we change if we change over briefly to the uh, different radar product. We go to the precipitation depiction. This should tell us roughly where the snow line is. Um, yeah, that's almost exactly where it is. So you can kind of see where this uh, green changes to blue is roughly the elevation where the snow is occurring. Uh, it's not that far up the road from Sacramento. It's a little bit upslope of Auburn. So between Auburn and uh, Forest Hill, Alta Sierra, um, you can kind of see that that's where this transition is occurring, maybe even a little bit lower for mixed precip in some spots. Uh, but there was a report of snow um, down in Angel's Camp earlier, so that's not too surprising. In fact, it looks like the snow level is decreasing a bit with time. This isn't perfect. This isn't going to capture the snow over the Bay Area because the peaks are so isolated. But this is a better indicator of the snow line uh, al along the western slope. Notably, uh, as this thunderstorm uh, moves up the western slope, this will probably become thundersnow somewhere up in here. So Grass Valley could see some thundersnow uh, in the next hour. Go back to the regular precipitation depiction. Um, I like that color scheme a little better. Uh, if we go up to Eureka, go up north, um, most of this system, by the way, is too far south. So you can see the clouds up here. You can actually see the spin of this low pressure system vaguely off here. Um, the winds are actually coming back down like this. So this is sort of why this is the unfavorable side of the system. So I don't really expect any significant impacts about north of here. So this is kind of a not, not a big deal. Um, some some uh, low elevation snow, maybe an isolated thunderstorm in this band, but then most of the interesting stuff is sort of from here southward uh, all the way down into Southern California to tomorrow. So right now it's Northern, Northern California tomorrow, Central and Southern California. And I don't think there's much going on. Uh, there's some showers moving into Santa Barbara, weak showers just starting out, but nothing too exciting. Some stronger ones up by the far uh, northwestern part of San Luis Obispo County coast, some stronger stuff, but that'll increase tonight into tomorrow. So really, it's the Bay Area and uh, Central Valley and Central Sierra foothills that have the interesting weather today and this evening. 
and then uh, farther south across Southern California into tomorrow. So I'm going to take one more look at questions. I'm going to, since there's not that much to show on radar right now, there's a few things, but it's not the world's most dramatic session. I'm going to switch back over to satellite because in, in some ways is more interesting. And then leave it up while I uh, talk with you about any additional comments that have come in in the meantime. Uh, there's another upvote from Jillian about talking about fog in a warming climate. So let's let's plan on having a session uh, for that uh, later in the spring. Uh, Michelle mentions that it's been snowing for hours in Fiddletown. Um, I don't know the exact elevation there, but it's not a place that, that gets snow that often, does occasionally. Jeremy mentioned the lightning strike in Groveland um, at 2,800 feet. So that would uh, essentially be thunder snow, given it's been snowing since then. Um, set a tree on fire. So, you know, just because it's thunder snowing doesn't mean you can't ignite a tree. Of course, the likelihood of it actually becoming a problematic wildfire is essentially zero. So one thing you don't have to worry about. Uh, but sometimes if it happens right next to a structure or something, that's still a problem. Uh, snowing in Nevada City. Michelle mentioned snowing at 2,200 feet since noon. Um, Thanks for the upvote, Tyler. Uh, and again, uh, please do subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff. Um, it, it, it really does uh, help grow the audience, and it's going to be something I'm actively trying to do this year. Our goal is to really scale things up, uh, get more people involved, uh, and participating regularly, both in the weather sessions like today's and the climate change sessions that I have periodically, or really just the general earth science conversations. For those of you who've tuned in for a lot of these know, um, this is something that uh, you sort of get the unvarnished version of Daniel Swain's uh, weather and climate and earth system thoughts. So, um, it you know, in that sense, um, not too many opportunities for that for the average person. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you can see my face again, uh, back up on screen. Uh, just so I can close uh, with a more personal touch. Uh, but that's about all I've got for you today. Um, I would not be too surprised, again, to see additional reports of pretty low elevation snowfall. This is a good opportunity if you have, uh, if you have the ability and the inclination to go up and see snow in the Santa Cruz Mountains. This looks like a, it could be a good evening for it. Uh, even if it's sunny right now, the chance of some snow later is, is, is pretty decent. Uh, potentially uh, disruptive thunderstorms tomorrow in some places. They will be somewhat isolated to scattered, but they could produce a lot of small hail. And inevitably, there'll be people on social media saying it snowed at sea level when it didn't, when it was actually hail. Uh, and inevitably, I'll be accused of being a killjoy uh, when I point that out. Um, it's not that... Uh, hail in, at the sea level in California can't be joyful. It's just that it is different than snow. And if it truly had snowed on the beaches of California in April, that would have been a pretty crazy thing, pretty historic, unbelievable thing. Um, but uh, that's not, this is not that kind of pattern. It, it's not going to happen. But there could be hail uh, on the beaches, and maybe they'll even see some, some graupel or some sort of hail-rhymed snowflakes inland. So various frozen precipitation types are possible. Probably the last opportunity this season in some places. I guess there's always next year. Uh, but this is an interesting storm. Um, could be some additional interesting weather as we go into this evening and tomorrow in particular. Not seeing widespread severe thunderstorm potential, but there could be an isolated one. And it may be the case that more people see lightning and hail than would normally be the case during a spring storm. So, um, you know... Enjoy it if you can. Some good cloud watching. Be careful on the roadways. If you drive into a giant hailstorm, you might as well treat it as if it's snow. Because again, it doesn't really care uh, for your vehicle's tires what the formal frozen precipitation type is. So anyway, I will, uh, pro I will probably have another session next week. It won't be on Monday. So date TBD. It will be some date other than Monday next week. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll let folks go. As usual, you can follow me on social media. Uh, 
I am in a lot of places. And uh, by the way, I am now officially uh, posting to the Fediverse via threads. So you can, uh, if you're on Mastodon, that is now how you can follow me from there. Uh, if you were averse to my Twitter auto, Twitter auto reposts, um, those are gone and it's now um, directly integrated with the Fediverse via, th uh, via threads. Um, and uh, the content you'll get there is still a little bit different than you'll get on Twitter slash X, but I am trying to find ways to scale it all up on all platforms so everyone essentially sees the same stuff. I'm not quite there yet. Um, the interoperability is not great, uh, but I'm doing my best. Uh, YouTube, I think, is working well. You can always follow me on the uh, Weather West blog. Uh, and I will uh, periodically hop in here on short notice, as I did today, to talk about interesting weather. There is a very slight chance that if things get really interesting tomorrow, that I might show up again uh, to talk about thunderstorms in Southern California. Uh, but uh, for the moment, I think I'm going to leave it uh, at that. Uh, enjoy the day and talk to you all later.